Hello to all of you. Myself, Dr. Shilpi Agarwal Gudara, and today we will be discussing the anatomy questions of Grand Test 179 of Bhatia Coaching Institute. Now, over here in this test, the anatomy questions are starting from question number 181. This question number 181 is the condition shown below is due to the options are the patent vitro intestinal duct, B is patent urecus, C is patent allantois and D is mid cut loop hernia. Now, if you see this picture, in this picture you can see a swelling which is present around the abdomen and it is present in the center. This is actually a swelling which is covered by a membrane and the membrane which is present over here is the amnion. This is due to the non return of the mid cut loop towards the abdomen. So, we use the term omphalocele for this that is it is a ventral abdominal defect in which the mid gut loop hernia which is actually a physiological herniation it does not return back to the abdominal cavity. Now, if you see this situation over here we can see this picture. This picture is showing this picture is showing the same diagram over here the swelling is present in the same manner and it is covered by the amnion and this condition is known as omphalocele. Another condition which is also a ventral abdominal, uh, abdominal defect, but in that this intestinal loops they come out, but they are not covered by the amnion such kind of condition is known as gastroschisis. In this we visualize the loops which come out of the abdomen which are present outside the abdomen and the position for that is slightly lateral to the center or slightly lateral to the umbilicus. Now, we come back to the rest of the options the answer for this question will be. So, therefore, the answer for this question will be D that is it is due to the mid gut loop hernia. Now, considering the rest of the options A, B and C if we see B and C the B and C option says patent urecus or patent allantois. The allantois structure the allantois it is actually present between the apex of the urinary bladder till the umbilicus. If you see this picture over here this is showing the sagittal section of the abdomen and over here this is the urinary bladder. Over here the umbilicus is present and this structure which extends from the umbilicus till the apex of urinary bladder this is the allantois. This is the allantois this allantois it converts into the urecus and then later on it will lead to the formation of the umbilical ligament in the adults. Now, if this allantois or the urecus it remains patent then in that situation there will be a communication between the urinary bladder and it will be communicating outside through the umbilicus. So, such kind of situation is known as urical fistula, urical fistula and in this situation a fistula can be seen at the umbilicus and clear fluid will be coming out of that fistula. That means, actually the urine is dribbling outside through the umbilicus through this communication. Another situation is patent vitlo intestinal duct. The vitlo intestinal duct it is a communication which is present between the mid gut loop and the yolk sac outside. Initially in the embryo if this is the mid gut loop it is communicating outside through the vitlo intestinal duct and outside the prime the yolk sac is present. Now, this communication or this vitlo intestinal duct will obliterate later on in adults, but if it does not obliterate what happens the mid gut loop will be communicating towards the exterior side through this through this uh, uh, communication towards the outside through the umbilicus and such kind of situation is known as vitlin fistula it is known as vitlin fistula or the umbilical fistula. In such situation a fistula is seen on the, uh, on the umbilicus and the fecal material is coming out through it. So, the rest of the options A, B and C they are totally different from the D option and no swelling in C is seen in option A, B and C. So, the answer for this question will be D. Now, we come to the next question question number 182. The question number 182 is 
all is true about the Sternbeck canal except option A is it is anterior and medial to the foramen rotundum. Yes, this is correct. Option B is it is posterior and lateral to foramen rotundum. It is wrong because this Sternberg canal it is present anterior and medial to the foramen rotundum. Now, next option is option C cause of intra sphenoidal meningeal seal. Yes, this is correct. And option D is can it can carry infection to the sphenoidal air sinus. This is also correct. All the options are correct except the B. So, the answer for this question number 182 is B. The position of the Sternberg canal it is anterior and medial to the foramen rotundum and it is usually formed during the fusion of the sphenoid bone. So, it is present between the posterior portion of the lesser wing and between the body of the sphenoid and due to that it is communicating between the middle cranial fossa and the communication is present between the middle cranial fossa till the nasopharynx. And it is one of the cause of congenital intrasphenoidal meningocele and it can carry infection to the sphenoidal air, air sinus as well as to the cranial fossa. The infection can come from the nasopharynx towards the sphenoidal air sinus. So, the answer for this question is B. Question number 183. The question number 183 says which of the which is not attached on the first rib? A scalenus anterior, B scalenus medius, C is scalenus posterior, D is suprapleural membrane. Now, in this all these structures are attached to the first rib except the sclenius posterior that is the option C because this muscle is attached to the second rib. Now, if you see this picture, in this picture we can see first rib and the second rib. This is the first rib and this is the second rib. The first rib is giving attachments to the scalenus anterior. The scalenus anterior it is attached over here and it is attached to the scalene tubercle which is present towards the inner side of the first rib. Over here you can see this muscle. This is the attachment of scalenus medius. This is scalenus medius. This is scalenus anterior and on the outer side or, an, or the outer border of the first rib over here the attachment of serratus anterior is there. As we go towards the medial end of the first rib over here there is attachment of the subclavius muscle. All these muscles are attached to the superior aspect. Now, the option C that was the scalenus posterior muscle. The scalenus posterior muscle is actually attached over here. This is the muscle scalenus posterior muscle which is attached over here on the second rib. The second rib apart from sclenius posterior is giving attachment to the rest uh, to the second digitation of the serratus anterior. Now, if you see the first rib in detail, this is the first rib. As we have already mentioned, this is the attachment of sclenius medius. Over here, attachment of sclenius anterior. This is the attachment of serratus anterior and this is the attachment of subclavius. Apart from this, the inner border, this is the inner border of the outer this is the inner border of the first rib and this inner border is giving attachment to suprapleural membrane. It is giving attachment to the suprapleural membrane. The outer border over here, this is the outer border of the first rib and this outer border is giving attachment to the, to the intercostal muscles, the external and the internal intercostal muscles. So, this outer border it is giving attachment to intercostal muscles. Apart from these attachments, it is related to the subclavian vessels. It is having a groove in front of the scalene tubercle and a groove behind the subclavian, uh, this scalene tubercle. The scalene tubercle is present over here. A groove which is in front of it, it gives passage to the subclavian, art, uh, subclavian vein as you can see over here. A groove which is present behind the scalene tubercle, it gives passage to the subclavian artery. Now, as we go towards the posterior side, near the neck it is related to four important structures from medial to lateral and these structures as you can see over here, the medial most structure is the sympathetic trunk. Then after that second structure is the vein which is the supreme intercostal vein. The third structure is the artery, the superior intercostal artery and the fourth structure is T1 nerve root. 
these are the four structures which are related to the neck of first rib. These are related to the neck of the first rib. These are the rest of the relations for the first rib. So, if we come back to the question, now we can very well say that for question number 183, the scalenus posterior that is option C is the answer which is not attached to the first rib, but it is attached to the second rib. Now, the next question, the next question is question number 184 that is supination and pronation does not take place at. Options are A is superior radio ulnar joint, B middle, middle radio ulnar joint, C inferior radio ulnar joint and D is radio carpal joint. Now, the supination and pronation movement, the supination pronation movement is like this, this is the supination movement and this is the pronation movement. For the supination and the pronation movement, the two main joints are the superior and the inferior radio ulnar joints. The superior and the inferior radio ulnar joints, if you go back uh, to this explanation, for the supination and pronation movement. The main joints for this will be superior and inferior radio ulnar joints. Now, if in this we talk about the rest of the joints that is the middle radio ulnar joint or the radio carpal, the radio carpal joint is this one, this is the radio carpal joint that is the wrist joint. Now, very less movement is possible at these both joints and therefore, uh, the, uh, we, are, we will be in flicks that which will be the answer. Now, if we talk about the middle radio ulnar joint, middle radio ulnar joint it is actually a syndesmosis type of joint which is present or which is uh, there due to the presence of the interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna. If the radius is present like this, the ulna is there. this is the ulna and the radius. The interosseous membrane is present in between. Now, due to the presence of this interosseous membrane, this middle radio ulnar joint is formed. When this supination and pronation movement is occurring, this middle radio ulnar joint is basically maintaining the stability of this movement, it stabilizes the whole of the movement. So, therefore, it is participating very less in this movement and if we talk about this wrist joint or radio carpal joint, the carpal bones which are present over here, this is the radio carpal joint. Now, what happens when we are doing this movement, supination and the pronation movement, if we do, if you rotate our hand more or we are supinating or pronating more then a slight movement occurs at the radio carpal joint also according to the recent references. So, if we have to choose between B and D option, we go back to the question, if we have to choose between the B and D option, we will say that D is the one which is having slight movements. So, the answer for this question will be B that is a middle radio ulnar joint because no movement is occurring at this place, it is only for the stability or it is stabilizing that movement. It, it stabilizes the whole of the joint. So, therefore, the supination and the pronation movement can occur effectively. Now, when this movement is occurring, supination and pronation, the excess for the supination and the pronation movement is oblique. It is passing through, it is passing through the head of the, this is the head of the radius, this line is oblique, it is going like this. So, it is passing through the head of the radius and below it is going towards the head or you can say towards the lower end of the ulna. So, this is the axis for the supination and pronation. When the supination movement is there like this, then the both the bones they are lying parallel to each other and when pronation movement occurs, the lower end of the radius it rotates and it comes up and it overlaps the lower end of the ulna. So, such kind of movement is occurring. For the pronation movement, the major muscles are pronator teres and the pronator quadratus and for the supination, the major muscle is the
the supinator muscle as well as the biceps for pronation we have pronator quadratus and the teres muscle and for the supination the major muscles are supinator and the biceps the biceps brachii muscle this biceps brachii muscle it is helping in the supination in when the arm is flexed when the arm is flexed like this then it helps in the supination movement the supination movement this is a characteristic for the biceps now the next question question number 185 the question number 185 is say is saying that endoderm gives rise to all the structures except option a is seminal vesicles option b is urinary bladder c is lower vagina and d is penile urethra now for this for this the answer will be it is giving rise uh, to all the structures except the seminal vesicle now how is it happening let's discuss regarding this in this the answer will be seminal vesicle and how the answer is seminal vesicle question is 185 now the seminal vesicle this structure it is derived from the mesonephric duct so let's write this that this is derived from mesonephric duct and the mesonephric duct is mesodermal in nature so the mesonephric duct mesodermal in nature so the structures which will be derived from the mesonephric duct will be derived from the mesoderm so seminal vesicle it is actually derived from the mesoderm and not for the from the endoderm the rest of the structures which are derived from the mesonephric duct are the mesonephric duct it is basically giving rise to the major portion of the male reproductive system it is giving rise to the epididymis vas deferens then it is also giving rise to the seminal vesicle ejaculatory duct then the mesodermal uh, portion of the prostate these are the structures of male reproductive system which are derived from the mesonephric duct apart from this the mesonephric duct it also gives rise to ureteric bud as well as it helps in the formation of the trigone of urinary bladder the trigone of the bladder these structures are formed in males ureteric bud and the trigone of the bladder these are formed in males as well as females the rest of the portion of the duct it degenerates in the females and it leads to the formation of a remnant in the females which is known as gartner's duct this is the remnant which is present in the female so all these structures which are derived from the mesonephric duct are mesodermal in nature now the other options for this question are one option is the another option is the urinary bladder now the urinary bladder it is derived from urogenital sinus the main portion of the urinary bladder is derived from the urogenital sinus except the trigone which is a small portion towards the base and this trigone is derived from as we have already discussed from the mesonephric duct so the main portion is formed by urogenital sinus and trigone is formed by mesonephric duct the absorption of the mesonephric ducts 
So, the main portion which is formed by urogenital sinus, this is actually derived from endoderm. So, therefore, we say that uh, we have considered this option as that it is mainly formed from the endoderm. Now, if we talk about the urogenital sinus, from where does it urogenital sinus comes from? Cloaca, the word is cloaca. The cloaca is the portion of the hindgut just distal to the allantois, to the attachment of the allantois. If we see, if this is the portion of the hindgut, this is hindgut and this is allantois. Now, the portion of the hindgut distal to the attachment of allantois, that means this portion. This portion is termed as cloaca. Now, what happened in, in this cloaca? A septum develops over here and this septum starts from the base of the allantois and this septum is known as urorectal septum. This septum, the uro rectal septum. This septum develops and it divides the whole of the cloaca into two parts. So, it has divided the whole of the cloaca into two parts, first and the second. Two parts are there. So, the cloaca it has divided into two parts and the two parts are the anterior part is the urogenital sinus and the posterior part is known as the primitive rectum. Now, anterior portion urogenital sinus, the urogenital sinus and the posterior portion is primitive rectum. Now, this urogenital sinus, it further divides into definitive urogenital sinus and the vesico urethral canal. definitive urogenital sinus and vesico urethral canal. This vesico urethral canal, it leads to the formation of the urinary bladder except the trigone. The definitive urogenital sinus, it leads to the formation of the urethra. The definitive urogenital sinus, it leads to the formation of the various parts of the urethra. It leads to the formation of the membranous urethra, prostatic urethra and the penile urethra. The prostatic part, then membranous part, and the penile urethra. So, it is leading to the formation of the major portion of the urethra. In this urethra, only uh, the distal portion of the urethra, which is near the glands in the penis, that is developed from the ectodermal groove and it is ectodermal in nature. So, a very small part near the external meters is developed from the ectoderm. Otherwise, the whole of the urethra is mainly derived from the definitive urogenital sinus. So, we will say now, as we have already seen in the options, the bladder the bladder is derived from endoderm because the hindgut is the endoderm and the penile urethra which is one of the options it is also derived from the endoderm so now we are clear that these structures are derived from the endoderm last option is the vagina the vagina it the development of the vagina is different for the upper portion and different for the lower portion. The upper portion and the lower portion. Now, the lower part of the vagina, it develops from the urogenital sinus. Certain swellings develop from there, sinovaginal bulbs are there, which will lead to the formation of the lower part and the upper part of vagina, it develops from the paramesonephric ducts. So, the upper part it derived it is derived from paramesonephric duct the 
the lower part it is derived from urogenital sinus the sinovaginal bulbs now in this if we see the upper part developed from the paramesonephric duct the paramesonephric duct it is mesodermal in nature so that means the upper part is derived from mesoderm the lower part derived from the urogenital sinus it is endodermal in origin so that solves our last option also that lower part of the vagina is derived from endoderm so now we come back to the question the question was question number 185 Endoderm gives rise to all the structures except. So in this only option A, seminal vesicle, it is derived from the mesoderm, and the rest of the options they are derived from the endoderm. So the answer for this question is A. Now next question is question number one eighty six. The question number one eighty six says that inferior vena cava develops from all except. Options are A is posterior cardinal vein, B is hepatocardiac channel c is subcardinal vein and d is mesonephric vein now in this all these structures lead to the formation of inferior vena cava except the mesonephric vein because the mesonephric vein it actually leads to the development of renal veins so the answer for this question is d now see let's see the development of inferior vena cava then how it is developing answer for this question is d mesonephric vein question number 186 answer is d mesonephric vein the mesonephric vein it does not contribute into into the ivc but it is leading to the formation of the renal vein now let's see for the inferior vena cava the rest of the structures which are contributing into it how they are contributing now if you see this picture this picture is showing the development of the inferior vena cava now for the development of inferior vena cava first of all if you see over here in this picture this is the posterior cardinal vein which is present in the blue color these are the posterior cardinal vein and they are present on the both sides initially but later on what happens that uh, only the right side remains and the veins towards the left side they regress so initially this is the pattern which is present the blue colored veins are the posterior cardinal veins and if we see the below uh, the portion below the posterior cardinal veins they are anastomosing with each other in the lower part another set of veins which is present in between the posterior cardinal veins this over here which is shown in the yellow color these veins are the sub cardinal veins these are sub cardinal vein now later on what happens another set of veins they appear so in the next picture you can very well see a green colored structure has arisen over here and another colored another structure over here in the red color has is present over there now the red colored structure which is present over here this is actually the supra cardinal vein this is uh, the supra cardinal vein the supra cardinal vein and the green colored structure which is shown over here these are the veins which are present in the liver hepatocardiac channel now this hepatocardiac channel it actually develops from the vitellin vein <coughs> now later on what happens these all components they anastomose with each other and it leads to the formation of the inferior vena cava so over here you can see the inferior vena cava is completely formed this is the picture showing the inferior vena cava and in this it is uh, the different components have been shown in the different colors this is the hepatocardiac channel in green color then in the yellow color the subcardinal veins are there 
there is a anastomosis between the hepatocardic channel and the subcardinal veins. Then as we come lower down, this point is showing the anastomosis between the subcardinal vein and supracardinal vein. The red colored structure is the supracardinal vein. In the lowermost portion, the lowermost portion of the inferior vena cava is, is uh, formed by the posterior cardinal vein and it, the anastomosis between the posterior cardinal veins. So, if we enumerate, if we enumerate the portions of uh, the inferior vena cava, we will just go back. So, for the development of the inferior vena cava, IVC. For the development of the inferior vena cava, we divide the whole of the inferior vena cava into three components. First is the hepatic component or the hepatic segment of the inferior vena cava. The hepatic segment, it actually develops from the right vitellin vein, which leads to the formation of the hepatocardic channel. So, the hepatic segment is contributed by hepatocardic channel derived from the right vitellin vein. Next segment is the renal segment. The renal segment of the inferior vena cava, this segment is derived from the subcardinal vein. The third component is the post renal segment. This segment is derived from the supracardinal vein. Now, these are the main structures which lead to the formation of the inferior vena cava, different different segments of the inferior vena cava. And if we start from below to above, the portions which lead to the formation of the IVC and how the IVC is formed. So, from below to above, the lowermost portion is contributed by the, the lowermost portion. It is contributed by the posterior cardinal vein. posterior cardinal vein and an ostomosis between the posterior cardinal vein, the two posterior cardinal vein. This is the right posterior cardinal vein. So, the lowermost portion is derived from the right posterior cardinal vein as well as the anastomosis between the right and the left or the two posterior cardinal veins. Then after that, <coughs> there is anastomosis uh, between this posterior cardinal vein component and the supracardinal vein. So, the next component is formed by the right supracardinal vein. The next component is derived from the anastomosis between supracardinal and subcardinal vein. Then as we go above, the rest of the segment, it is derived from subcardinal vein. And above this subcardinal vein is anastomosing with the hepatocardic channel. So, the fi so fifth point will include anastomosis between subcardinal vein and hepatocardic channel. And the uppermost portion, the uppermost portion is contributed by the hepatocardiac channel. This is forming the uppermost part of the IVC. So, 
So, if we discuss, if we see it again from below to above, the lowest most portion of the IVC, it is contributed by the posterior cardinal vein of the right side as well as the anastomosis between the right and the left posterior cardinal vein. So, the posterior cardinal vein is helping in the formation of inferior vena cava. As we go above, now the supra cardinal vein on the right side, they are also contributing into the formation of the inferior vena cava. So, the supra cardinal vein also it contributes in the formation of the IVC. Then the anastomosis between the supra cardinal and the sub cardinal vein, after that the sub cardinal vein that is also towards the right side, the right supra cardinal vein as we go above the anastomosis between the sub cardinal and the hepatocardial channel cardiac channel and the lastly towards the uppermost area the hepatocardiac channel of the right side. So, all these structures they are contributing in the formation of the inferior vena cava and any structure which is mentioned apart from it will be not contributing into the IVC as has been mentioned in this question. So, if you come back to the question, in this the posterior cardinal vein A, it contributes in formation of IVC, hepatocardic channel, sub cardinal vein and also the supra cardinal vein, all these will help in the formation of IVC except the option D. So, the answer for this question 186 is D mesonephric vein. The next question is question number 187. The question number 187 is regarding the ischiorectal fossa. It says true about the ischiorectal fossa. You have to find the point, point which is correct. Option A is perineal membrane forms the base. This is wrong because the skin is actually forming the base of the ischiorectal fossa. B option is middle rectal neurovascular bundle passes through it. This option is also wrong because the internal pudendal vessels are passing through the ischiorectal fossa and it leads to the formation or it branches to give inferior rectal neurovascular bundle. So, it is giving passage to inferior rectal neurovascular bundle actually. Option C is a communication is present between the two ischiorectal fossa behind anal canal. This is correct because the ischiorectal fossa which are present towards the right and the left side, they are actually communicating with each other behind the anal canal. So, this is actually a U shaped structure which is present like this, a U shaped structure is there, ischiorectal uh, fossa and it is communicating with each other behind the anal canal. So, the, this option is correct. Option D is levator ani with anal fascia forms the apex. Now, this option is uh, wrong because the anal fascia it combines with the obturator fascia and they actually form the apex. So, the answer for this question will be C that is a communication is present between the two ischiorectal fossa behind the anal canal. So, question number 187, if we go for the explanation in this, now this picture is uh, showing the ischiorectal fossa. The ischiorectal fossa they are actually present on the lateral aspects of the uh, in the in the lower portions of the pelvis and uh, it is on the either side of the lower portions of rectum and in this picture as you can see towards this side a muscle is present and this muscle is the levator and eye muscle this muscle is present towards the medial side and towards the lower aspect over here the muscle which is present over here this is actually the external anal sphincter. Now, these muscles, this levator and eye muscle and the external anal sphincter, they are present towards the medial side along with the fascia that is the anal fascia. So, these structures are actually forming the medial boundary and towards the lateral side, we have this is a lateral boundary this structure over here will be forming the lateral boundary. The lateral boundary is formed by the ischial tuberosity. The ischial tuberosity and a muscle which is attached to it that is the obturator internus. So, if we just say that uh, which structures are forming the medial boundary and the lateral boundary which can be seen over here towards the medial side, the medial wall it is formed by levator and eye muscle we say 1 plus this external anal sphincter 2 plus 
the fascia which is covering it that is anal fascia. These structures are forming the medial wall towards the lateral side or the lateral wall of the ischiorectal fossa. The lateral wall is formed by the ischial tuberosity. And along with the ischial tuberosity, the muscle which is present over here, the obturator internus. And the fascia covering it, that is the obturator fascia. Now, these are the structures which are forming the lateral wall over the lateral side. Now, the structures forming the base and the structures forming the apex. Now, if you come back to this picture, this is the base, this is the base of the ischiorectal fossa and towards here, this is the apex. So, this is the base, the base is formed by skin, the apex, the apex is this one. The apex is actually formed by anal fascia, which is coming from this side, that is from the medial side and a fascia is coming from the lateral side. The fascia which is coming from lateral side is obturator fascia, which is covering the obturator internus and the fascia which is coming from the medial side is the anal fascia. As they meet each other, they will form the apex. So, the apex is formed actually by the uh, meeting point of anal fascia and the obturator fascia. So, this is formed by It is formed by meeting point of anal fascia and obturator fascia. So, the apex uh, over here uh, by the anal and the obturator fascia. This diagram is actually showing the apex, it is showing the base, it is showing the medial wall and it is showing the lateral wall. Now, if you go to the next picture, this is a parasagittal section and this parasagittal section will show the anterior portion of the ischiorectal fossa as well as towards the posterior side of the ischiorectal fossa. Over here, this whole space present here is the ischiorectal fossa. Now, if you see, this is the anterior aspect and this is the posterior aspect. Towards the posterior side, we have a muscle over here. The muscle which is present over here, this muscle this is the gluteus maximus muscle. So, the posterior boundary towards the posterior side or the posterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa, it is formed by gluteus maximus muscle. The gluteus maximus muscle and apart from that, it is contributed by the sacrotuberous ligament which is present over here at this point also contributed by sacro tuberous ligament. Now, towards the anterior side, now towards the anterior side over here, the anterior side or the anterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa is formed by the perineal membrane. You can see over here, the perineal membrane, it is present, the perineal membrane is present over here like this. So, the perineal membrane is forming the anterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa. The anterior boundary, it is formed by perineal membrane. Now, these are the boundaries as well as the apex and the base of the ischiorectal fossa and if we see if you draw a schematic diagram that uh, this is the opening of the anal canal, the opening of the urethra, the ischiorectal fossa which are present on either side, this is the ischiorectal fossa. Now, these ischiorectal fossa, they are actually in the form of U shape and they are communicating with each other behind the opening of the anal canal. So, therefore, if we come back to the question now again, we can very well say that the answer for this question is C that is a communication is present between the two ischiorectal fossa and the rest of the options are 
wrong, which is actually we have just discussed the boundaries, apex and the base of the ischiorectal fossa. Now, next we come to the question number 188. The question number 188 says punit square. The punit square is used to calculate. Option A is genotype of the offspring, B diseased and non diseased individuals, C is statistical data collection, D is anatomical surface area of human body. Now, this punit square is characteristically used for calculating the genotype of the offspring. The punit square, we use this punit square to determine uh, for the various genetic the various genetic combinations which can be formed for a offspring form, uh, from the parents. For example, if we just discuss regarding this, the punit square. For example, if the parents are autosomal recessive and they are acting as carrier, then the genotype will be this one for the both of the parents. If this is the mother, she is recessive, but uh, she is just a carrier and in this the father is also carrier and we have to we have to find that what genotype can be present in the offsprings and to what percentage. Then we use this punit square and how do we calculate? We make a square like this. On one end, we put the genotype of one parent and on the other side, we write the genotype of the second parent and now we make the combinations. If A and A they combine, they will form capital A. Then over here capital A combines with small a, again capital A small a and over here the combination is small a small a. Now, these are the various combinations which can be present in the offspring and from this we can calculate very well that 25 percent of the offspring they will be healthy. That means, no recessive trait is carried in this. Again the 25 percent that is this one. This 25 percent if we see it is auto, it is showing the disease of the autosomal recessive. So, 25 percent of the offspring may be diseased. autosomal res, uh, recessive. The rest of the offsprings, if you see over here, that is this one and this one, that is 50 percent, they are carrying the trait and we say that they are the carriers. So, 50 percent will be the carriers, they will carry the trait for the autosomal recessive, but they will not uh, exhibit that disease. So, they are termed as the carriers. So, by this we have come to know that with the help of the punit square that 25 percent are healthy, 25 percent will be can be diseased and 50 percent can be carriers. So, if we come back to the question again, the answer for this question number 188 will be A that is the genotype of the offspring. Next question, the question number 189. In the question number 189, it is showing a picture, a histological picture in which you have to identify the various structures and then you will answer the question accordingly. The question is choose the incorrect option. So, you have to choose the incorrect option for the arrow marked cells in the given histological section. Now, in this if you first of all see the picture. In this picture, we will just come to this uh, picture. In this picture, actually the A structure, yes, over here this is the picture. The structure which is present over here, I will just show you. Yeah, this was the picture. In this, the structure A, this was the structure A. The structure A is actually focused on the basophils. The A is basophils. A is basophils. The structure B over here, the structure B is the arrow mark is being put on the acidophils. The slide is of the anterior pituitary. The 
this histological slide is for the entire pituitary which consists of the chromophyll cells and the chromophobe cells. the chromophyll and the chromophobe cells. The chromophyll cells is of two types acidophils and the basophil cells according to the, uh, the stain which is taken up by the granules and therefore, the cells which we have identified A and B the acidophils and the basophils they are the chromophyll cells or the component of the anterior pituitary and they form the major component of the anterior pituitary. Now, we come to the option C this is the option C. In the option C, if you see, you can visualize the nucleus, but the cytoplasm which is outside is very less conspicuous and you cannot visualize it very well. So, this is a characteristic of the chromophobe cell. So, this is chromophobe cell which is again a part of the anterior pituitary. The D option over here, this has been marked on the sinusoids, these are the sinusoids. So, now we have identified that A is basophil, B is acidophil, C is chromophobe so cell and D is sinusoids. Now, in this the characteristic feature of the acidophils is that the acidophil cells they are of two types, they are they can be of uh, the acidophil cell the acidophil cells they are can be of two types mammotrop and somatotrop and therefore, they will be secreting the hormones accordingly. The basophil cells they are of they can be of three types it can be thyrotrop, gonadotrop and corticotrop. and therefore, they will be secreting the hormones accordingly. Now, if you come back to the question after discussing this, now the question says the option A is A, A we have already identified A is basophil cell, A releases mammotrophic hormone. This is uh, wrong because basophils does not secrete the mammotrophic hormone, it is secreted by the acidophils. Next option is option B, B releases somatotrophic hormone. B is acidophil and yes, it does release somatotrophic hormone. So, this option is correct. Option C is C releases melanocyte stimulating hormone. C is chromophobe cell and it does release melanocyte stimulating hormone. So, it is correct. Option D is D is sinusoid. So, we have already identified that D is a sinusoid. Now, the answer uh, for this question or the incorrect option for this question will be A. So, the answer for this 189 question will be A that A releases mammotrophic hormone which is not correct. Now, we come to the next question. The next question over here is question number 190 arrow marked structure in the given picture is. Now, you have to identify that arrow marked structure the options are arcuate fasciculus, uncinate fasciculus, cingulate fasciculus and fronto occipital fasciculus. Now, this is a picture which has been given over here, <coughs> the arrow is marked over here. Now, this arrow is on the fibers, the fibers are having a characteristic feature that these are hook shaped fibers and they are starting from the orbitofrontal region, this is the frontal lobe, over here this is the frontal lobe, towards this side is the temporal towards the posterior most side this is the occipital lobe and this is the parietal portion. Now, if you see the characteristic feature of these fibers these are uh, these are actually coming from the orbitofrontal region this is the orbitofrontal region and this area is the anterior medial portion of the temporal lobe. Now, this set of fibers which are actually connecting the orbitofrontal region of the frontal lobe to the anterior medial portion of the temporal lobe, it is actually the 
uncinate fasciculus. So, these fibers are the uncinate fasciculus. So, the answer for this question will be the uncinate fasciculus. Now, if we see the fibers, the rest of the fibers which have been mentioned over here, the occipital frontal fibers, the occipital frontal fibers are actually these fibers which are present over here. These are the fibers which are occipital frontal fibers, which are running like this over here. These are occipital frontal fibers or the fasciculus. The fibers which are going towards the upper side over here, if you see, which are spreading in a radial manner, these are the fibers of corona radiata. The other options which have been mentioned over here, the cingulate gyrus, uh, the cingulate fasciculus and the arcuate fasciculus. Now, what are those fibers? If we draw the sagittal section of the brain, in, in the sagittal section we can visualize the corpus callosum. Now, the fibers which are running along this corpus callosum, they actually arise from the cingulate gyrus they are present in the cingulate gyrus arising from the limbic portion and they are going to the entorhinal area. These fibers over here, they are termed as cingulate fasciculus. Also termed as cingulum. Another set of fibers, arcuate fibers, they are actually present towards the outer side if we draw the lateral aspect of the cerebrum, if this is the lateral aspect of the cerebrum, the arcuate fasciculus are the fibers which actually connect the motor and the sensory speech areas. These speech areas which are present over here, the Wernicke speech area and the Broca speech area. This is the Broca speech area and this is the Wernicke speech area. The Wernicke is the sensory speech area and the Broca is the motor speech area. Now, the fibers which connect these areas like this, these are the fibers which are termed as arcuate fasciculus. So, now we if we come back to this picture, the arrow has been marked over the uncinate fasciculus. So, the answer for this question The answer for this question will be B. So, the answer for the question number 190 is B, uncinate fasciculus. Next, we come to the question number 191. The 191 question, it says, first palmar interosciae muscle is supplied by, options are A is median nerve, B ulnar nerve, C radial nerve and D musculocutaneous nerve. Now, in this we know that palmar interosciae muscle, it is a muscle of the hand, it is one of the intrinsic muscles of the hand and first of all to rule out other options. For the hand, all the muscles of the hand, they are either supplied by the median nerve or the ulnar nerve. So, we have to choose between option A and B. The rest of the options are not, uh, they, are, uh, they will not be supplying the muscles of the hand. Now, for the interosci muscles or for the muscles of the hand, all the muscles or all the intrinsic muscles of the hand, they are mainly supplied by the ulnar nerve except three muscles of the thenar group and first and second lumbricals. So, we come to the explanation of this question. For the hand, the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Now, for the intrinsic muscles of the hand, we know that uh, in this one group is the thinar group. and hypothenar group is there. Now, in the thenar group, we have flexor pollicis brevis and 
then we have abductor pollicis brevis, adductor pollicis and opponents pollicis. Abductor, opponents and adductor. These are the four muscles in the thena group. For the hypothena group, we have digiti minimi muscles, the flexor digiti minima is there. Then abductor digiti minimi and opponents digiti minima is there. Apart from this, palmaris brevis is also included as one of the hypothenar muscles, though it is under controversy still now. Another set of muscles which is present in the hand is lumbricals. Now, we always the, there are four tendons for the lumbricals and the counting will start from the thumb. The first lumbricals, second, third and fourth. So, we are having four tendons for the lumbricals and apart from this we have intrusia. The intrusia muscles are there and they are of two types palmar and dorsal. Now, in this all the muscles are supplied by the ulnar nerve except these three muscles that is a flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis and opponents. These three muscles these are supplied by median nerve, adductor pollicis it is supplied by the ulnar nerve. Whole of the hypothena group, the whole of the hypothena group is supplied by the ulnar nerve. Then for the lumbricals, the first and second, the first and second lumbrical it is supplied by median nerve and third and fourth lumbrical it is supplied by the ulnar nerve. For the introsiae, all the introsiae, all the palmar and all the dorsal introsiae they are supplied by the ulnar nerve. So, now the question has been asked on the first palmar intrusiae. So, we come to know that first palmar intrusiae or all the palmar intrusiae they are being supplied by the ulnar nerve. So, the answer for this question, question number 191 will be option B that is ulnar nerve. Question number 192, the 192 question says the following muscles are supplied by an interior branch of mandibular division of trigeminal nerve except. Now, in this we should be knowing the branching pattern of the mandibular nerve which branches are given by the main trunk of the mandibular nerve, what are the branches coming from the anterior division and the posterior division of the mandibular nerve. Now, for this the mandibular nerve the mandibular nerve it is one of the branches of uh, the trigeminal nerve. The rest of the branches of the trigeminal nerve are ophthalmic, ophthalmic nerve and the maxillary nerve. Now, this mandibular nerve it comes out of the cranial cavity through the foramen ovale. Initially the trunk is there, the main trunk, the branches which arise from the main trunk. If you consider the branches arising from the mandibular nerve, the branches which arise from the trunk or main part of the mandibular nerve are the one of the branches meningeal branch also known as nervous spinosis and nerve to the nerve to medial pterygoid. These are the branches which arise directly from the trunk. Then after that as the nerve continues if this is the main trunk it will divide into two divisions. One division goes anteriorly and another division goes posteriorly. Now, this anterior division It further gives branches, it gives nerve to medial, nerve to lateral pterygoid, then it gives a branch to the masseter muscle, masseteric nerve, then deep temporal nerve and buccal nerve. Now, in this nerve to medial pterygoid is to the 
uh, nerve to medial pterygoid will be supplying the medial pterygoid muscle and that nerve is arising from the trunk over here you can see the rest of the muscles of mastication that is lateral pterygoid masseter and the temporalis muscle they are being supplied from branches of anterior division via nerve to lateral pterygoid masseteric nerve and deep temporal nerve so these are supplying the rest of the muscles buccal nerve is a sensory nerve from the posterior division of mandibular nerve the nerves which are arising are auriculotemporal nerve then lingual nerve and inferior alveolar nerve now if you come back to the question the question says ki following muscles are supplied by anterior branch or the division of mandibular division or the mandibular nerve except so in this the answer for this question will be b because the medial pterygoid is supplied from a branch coming from trunk only and rest of the muscles are supplied by the branches which are coming from the anterior division of the mandibular nerve so the answer for this question number 192 is b now the next question is question number 193 it says a surgeon resects the part of the left lobe of the liver adjacent to the falciform ligament that is towards the left side of the lobe adjacent to the falciform ligament towards the left side now which of the following segments surgeon is actually resecting you have to find which segment has been resected so this is actually based on the corneas classification of the liver and we will first of all see the corneas classification for the corneas classification now this picture is showing the corneas classification of the liver now first of all the anatomical division of the liver we divide the liver anatomically into right and the left lobe over here you can see this anatomical division right lobe and the left lobe this anatomical division is due to the presence of the falciform ligament or the umbilical fissure which is present over here this is the site where the falciform ligament is present so the whole of the liver is divided into right and the left lobes anatomically now we divide the liver into two parts according to this corneas classification or physiological division for that we use uh, Im an imaginary line known as cantilever line now this cantilever line this is actually passing it is actually passing through the inferior vena cava the groove for the inferior vena cava till the middle of the gall bladder so this line it will be passing over here this is the point for uh, where the cantilever line is passing this is the anterior view of the liver towards the posterior view the line will be passing over here like this so now this is showing the right and the left parts of the liver so therefore we have written over here left part and this is the right part of the liver now further these left and the right parts they are divided into various segments which are functionally independent segments towards the left side we have four segments and towards the right side we have four segments so total eight segments are there total eight segments are there towards left side four segments starting from 1 2 4 and on the right side again four segments starting from fifth to the eighth now how these are placed if you see towards the anterior view this is the anterior view on the left side we can visualize second third and fourth segments we cannot visualize the first segment because the first segment is present towards the posterior side and it is actually the caudate lobe so it can be visualized on the posterior side only so if you see the posterior view this is the posterior view this is the first segment over here this is the first segment and this is the caudate lobe apart from that if you start counting now if you will uh, start counting the counting will start in this direction like this you will go anti clockwise so this is second third fourth 
fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth segment. Now, if you visualize in the anterior side, in the anterior side only second, third and fourth can be seen. The fourth sometimes is divided into 4 a above and 4 b below. The 4 b below is representing the quadrate lobe of the liver. Now, as we uh, go for the question, in the question it says that the surgeon has resected the left portion of the lobe just adjacent to the falciform ligament. Now, if you focus on the question, the falciform ligament is present over here. This is the falciform ligament and this is the left portion, the portion which is towards the left side of the falciform ligament. That means, the segment 2 and segment 3 has been removed. Now, we go back to the question. We again read this question. A surgeon resects the part of the left lobe of liver adjacent to the falciform ligament that is the segment 2 and 3. Which of the following segments has been resected? Now, for the options we will look for it segment 1 and 4 a no this is not the answer segment 2 and 3 yes this is the answer. So, answer for the question is B question number 193 the answer is B the rest of the segments they do not correspond to the whatever uh, information has been given. So, answer for this question is B next question the next question is regarding the neck dissection. During the neck dissection, the stylet process is used as a landmark. Okay. Which of the following statements correctly pertains to one of the following, one of the four structures that attach to the stylet process? So, we have to choose a correct statement. First statement is A is stylohyoid muscle, it attaches to the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone. So, first of all, what we will do before reading these options, we will just go back to a diagram for the stylet process only the muscles and the ligaments attached to the styloid process and we collectively give a term styloid apparatus to that. Now, this picture is showing the structures being attached which are attached to the styloid process. The structures, there are five structures which are attached to the styloid, uh, styloid process and we use the term styloid apparatus for this. Three muscles are attached, the muscles which are attached are stylohyoid muscle, then styloglossus muscle is there and third muscle is stylopharyngeus. Then there are two ligaments are there, one ligament is stylohyoid ligament, and fifth structure is the stylomandibular ligament. Now, these five structures are attached to the styloid process. Over here, if you see the various structures which are attached, first over here we can see styloglossus muscle. The styloglossus muscle, it starts from uh, attachment, one of the attachment to the styloid process and then it goes towards the lateral aspect of the tongue and it is inserted into the tongue. Stylohyoid muscle, the stylohyoid muscle shown over here, <coughs> this muscle is the stylohyoid muscle. Starting from the styloid process, it is going below in the neck over here and it is attached to the hyoid bone and in the hyoid bone, it is attached to the lesser cone. If you see the muscle over here, this structure over here is the lesser cornu and this long projection over here, this is the greater cornu. The rest of the portion over here, this is termed as the body of the sphenoid. So, stylohyoid muscle, it is attached to the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone and as you can see over here, as it is atta getting attached to the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone, it is splitting into two portions two portions are there splitting into the two portions and one of the structure which is passing through these two splittings, these are the, this muscle is the digastric muscle. So, towards the lower portion of the stylohyoid muscle, it is divided into two splits into two portions and in between the two portion of that, a muscle is passing through it and that muscle is the digastric muscle. So, the digastric muscle is passing through it. Now, we come to the third muscle the third muscle is stylopharyngeus. The stylopharyngeus muscle attached to the styloid process and from the styloid process, it comes to the pharynx. 
it comes to the pharynx and it forms the one of the longitudinal muscles of the pharynx and below it is inserted to the posterior border of the thyroid lamina. So, these are the three muscles, then the two ligaments are there, stylohoid ligament. The ligament has been shown over here, this is the stylohoid ligament. The stylohoid ligament, it starts from the styloid process and below it is attached to the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone. The fifth ligament is stylomandibular. Now, if you see this picture, this picture is showing the stylomandibular ligament. This is the stylomandibular ligament. The stylomandibular ligament on one side it is attached to the styloid process and on the other end it is attached to the angle of mandible over here. It is formed due to the thickening of the deep cervical fascia. Then a ligament, one more ligament which is attached to the mandible is sphenomandibular. If you see over here sphenomandibular ligament, the sphenomandibular ligament on one side is attached to the spine of sphenoid and on another side it is attached to the inner aspect of the mandible to the lingula. So, this portion it is coming below over here towards the inner aspect of the mandible. So, we have come to know the various uh, regarding the various facts of the styloid apparatus, the structures attached to the styloid process. Now, we will come back to the question and we will just see the options. In this we have to choose a correct statement. The option is stylohyoid muscle is attached to the lesser corner of the hyoid bone. Yes, this is correct. Option B is styloglossus muscle acts to protrude the tongue. The styloglossus muscle it helps in the retraction of the tongue. For the protrusion of the tongue, the main muscle is genioglossus. So, this option is not correct, it is wrong. Option C is stylohyoid ligament attaches to the lingula of the mandible. The stylohyoid ligament it attached it is attached to the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone. So, therefore, this option is wrong. Then option D is distally the stylopharyngeus muscle is split by digastric muscle. This option is also wrong because distally the stylohyoid muscle is the one which is split by the digastric muscle. So, the answer for this question will be A. So, question number 194 answer is A. Now, we come to the next question, question number 195. It is showing a histological picture. All are true about the cartilage shown in the figure except we have to choose a incorrect statement. If you see the picture over here, this picture is showing the uh, high line cartilage. This is a characteristic picture of the high line cartilage. Now, the options are A high line cartilage with chondrocytes in lacunae. Yes, this is the highland cartilage which is present along with the chondrocytes and the chondrocytes are present in lacunae. B option is it ossifies with aging. Yes, it ossifies with aging. C option is this is the most abundant cartilage. Yes, this is the most abundant cartilage of the body. D option says present in intervertebral disc. This option is not correct because in the intervertebral disc the cartilage which is present is the fibrocartilage. So, the answer for this question will be question number 195 will be answer D. We will just go back to the pictures. Now, if we try to compare, if we see over here, this picture has been shown over here. This is the highline cartilage. The next picture which is shown over here is the elastic and this one is the fibro cartilage. Now, the characteristic feature for the cartilage is that, that the chondrocyte is there which is the basic cell and this chondrocyte is present within the lacuna, a lacuna is present. So, this is the chondrocyte and around it or the cell is actually present in a lacuna. Now, in the hyaline cartilage you can see the cell nest is there, the characteristic feature of this is the presence of cell nest or the cell group. In this, the cells are present in groups of 2, 3 or 4 like this and if you compare it with the elastic, the cells or the chondrocytes, they are present singly. Now, if you compare the picture with the fibro cartilage, in the fibro cartilage, you can see that the cells are less in number and more of fibers are there, more of collagen fibers are there. Cells are smaller and they are arranged in rows like this. So, this is the basic difference between the three types of the cartilage. Now, if we see the locations, the locations of these cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, the 
location of the hyaline cartilage is it is present in the nasal cartilages then it is present in the tracheal and the bronchial cartilage so present in nasal tracheal and the bronchial cartilage now apart from this it is present in the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid present in the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage as well as the base of arytenoid these are the locations where the hyaline cartilage is there apart from this it is also present in articular cartilage then costal cartilage and the epiphyseal plate now these are the areas where the hyaline cartilage is present for the elastic cartilage the sites for the elastic cartilage is it is present in ear pinna then it is present in epiglottis it is present in external equestic meatus or the external equestic canal then it is present in the station tube apart from this it is present in the corniculate and the cuneiform cartilages and the apex of the arytenoid now for the fibrocartilage this is the cartilage which is present in the intervertebral disc apart from the intervertebral disc the fibrocartilage is also present in the articular disc which is present within the temporomandibular joint or the sternoclavicular joint as well as it is present in the glenoidal labrum and the acetabular labrum and the menisci of the knee so these are the locations for the various cartilages and if we come back to the question if we come back to the question the answer for this 195 question as we have already discussed is d because hyaline cartilage is not present in intervertebral disc in this the fibrocartilage is present so the answer for this question is d the next question 196 the question number 196 says which nerve supplies the area of nose which is involved in varicella zoster infection as shown in the picture now in this we can see this picture is showing vesicles which are present at near the tip of the nose or to, towards the lower portion of the nose so we have to look for the nerve which will supply this portion of the nose near the tip and the lower portion of nose because the varicella zoster infection as we know it remains dormant in the dorsal root ganglion of the nerves and when it is reactivated it spreads through the nerve and it reaches the area of the skin to which that nerve is supplying and over there the blisters appear the painful blisters will appear so now there in this options we will see antiethmoidal nerve b is infraorbital nerve c is nasociliary nerve and d is the infratrochlear nerve now regarding the nerve supply of the face if you see the nerve supply of the face the majority of the face is supplied by the branches of the trigeminal nerve the area towards the forehead and towards the nose is mainly supplied by the branches of the ophthalmic nerve then upper cheek area is supplied mainly by the branches of maxillary nerve and the lower jaw area and the lower cheek area is supplied by the branches of the mandibular nerve except the angle of the jaw which is being supplied by the great auricular nerve and that great auricular nerve is coming from the cervical plexus so over here in the picture you can see these are the branches now the vesicles were present over here this was the location for the vesicles so we have to look for the nerve which is supplying it this is the v1 is the ophthalmic nerve and this ophthalmic nerve it mainly divides into three branches the lacrimal nerve frontal nerve and the nasociliary now this lacrimal nerve the lacrimal nerve is present over here the lacrimal nerve it supplies the lacrimal gland and the lateral half of upper eyelid for the frontal nerve the frontal nerve as it comes out then it divides into two branches that is the supratrochlear and the supraorbital which are present over here this is the supratrochlear branch and this is the supraorbital branch 
the supratrochlear branch it supplies the lower portion of the forehead the skin over here and the supratrochlear supraorbital nerve it supplies the whole of the forehead and the scalp till the vertex so it is supplying the upper area then we come to the next branch that is the nasociliary nerve the nasociliary nerve it divides into anterior ethmoidal nerve posterior ethmoidal nerve it divides into anterior ethmoidal posterior ethmoidal nerve then it is giving long ciliary nerve and infratrochlear nerve apart from this it is giving sensory branches to the ciliary ganglion now for the long ciliary nerve it is going towards the eyeball and it gives sensory supply to the iris ciliary body and the cornea then for the posterior ethmoidal nerve it gives uh, supply to the ethmoidal ear sinus and sphenoidal ear sinus now we are, we have infratrochlear nerve if we come back over here this is the location this is the location for the infratrochlear nerve the infratrochlear nerve is present over here and it is basically supplying the bridge of the nose and it is supplying the upper eyelid now we are left with this anterior ethmoidal nerve this anterior ethmoidal nerve it is given within the cranial cavity and a characteristic feature of this is that uh, so it is given in the orbit and from the orbit it will enter into the anterior cranial fossa through the anterior ethmoidal canal then it comes back to the nasal cavity through a, a fissure which is present on the sides of the cristaglia as it comes to the nasal cavity it gives external nasal branch and internal nasal branch the internal nasal branch is supplying the nasal septum and the lateral wall of the nose from inside the external nasal branch it comes outside and it supplies the lower portion of the nose so over here we can see over here we can see this is the external nasal branch and this external nasal branch is the one which is actually supplying this area the tip of the nose or the lower whole of this lower portion of the nose and the vesicle is also present over here that means that this nerve is involved or we can say the answer will be anterior ethmoidal nerve or its main nerve is the nasociliary nerve now because both the nerves are being mentioned in the option we will go for the best answer the best answer will be the nasociliary nerve why is it so because the virus is present dominantly in the dorsal root ganglion and when it is activated it travels through whole of the nerve and then it reaches to the various nerve branches so first of all the nasociliary nerve is affected and then the rest of the branches will be affected so the best answer will be nasociliary nerve and that through that route the uh, the virus has reached towards the tip of the nose and the vesicles are present over here so we go back to the question for the question number 196 the answer will be c that is the nasociliary nerve now the next question is the next question is question number 197 the question number 197 it is regarding the development of the face it says nasolacrimal duct will not be formed with the oblique facial cleft due to non fusion of which of the following ridges now for this first of all we should be aware of these ridges so we will go back to this picture now the picture for this for the development of the face for the development of the face the development of the face is with the help of the main three processes and those three main processes are first is fronto nasal process the fronto nasal process or the prominence second is maxillary the maxillary process and third is the mandibular in this the fronto nasal process it also gives rise to two more processes and tho those are medial and the lateral nasal processes medial and lateral nasal process the fronto nasal process is coming from above the mesial camel collection which is present anterior to the developing cns or the neural tube so over here it is present and it comes from the front it is forming major of the forehead 
and near the uh, near the the placodes, the nasal placodes which are present over here, the swellings appear and those are known as medial and the lateral nasal process and they come towards the medial side, they project down, they help in the formation of the nose. The maxillary pro process, it is coming from the lateral side, it gives rise to the main portion of the upper cheek as well as it is giving rise to the lateral portions of the upper lip. Then the mandibular process is coming from the lower side, it gives rise to the lower jaw and whole of the lower lip. Now, if you just make a diagram for this, the frontonasal process is coming from above, this is the frontonasal process, I am marking it as 1, then the frontonasal process is unpaired, the maxillary process is paired coming from the sides and same way the mandibular process is, process is uh, also paired and it is forming the lower portion. Now, over here, the medial and the nasal, lateral nasal processes are formed. The swellings which are present over here, this is the lateral nasal pro process and this one is the medial. As the further growth occurs, as the further growth will occur, the frontal nasal process, it gives a projection downward. This is the maxillary process and this one is the mandibular process. This is mandibular, this is maxillary and this is the frontonasal process. The frontonasal process is giving projection downwards and this projection is formed by the medial and the lateral nasal process in which the medial nasal process is present in over here. This is the medial nasal process. And towards the lateral side over here, this process which is on the lateral side, this is the lateral nasal process. The medial nasal process, it is going till lower down area and it contributes in the formation of the philtrum also as well as it contributes in the formation of the central portion of the upper lip. But the lateral nasal process, it is forming, it is contributing in the formation of the lateral portions of the nose and it is still the ala portion only. So, now over here, what they have mentioned is that the oblique facial cleft, this oblique facial cleft, it is actually present due to non-union of this area, of this area and if we see that the non-union this is the point where the oblique facial cleft will be there. This oblique facial cleft, it is due to the non-union of maxillary process and lateral nasal process, if you see over here. And due to this, what happens? This cleft is coming from the medial canthus of eye and it is continuing till the, uh, the lip over here. And uh, when the fusion occurs over here, the nasal lacrimal duct is formed. And if the cleft is present, this nasal lacrimal duct is not present and it is exposed on the face and whatever uh, lacrimal fluid is formed, it will dribble out of it. So, now if we go back to the question, if we see this diagram, in this first of all we will identify the various processes. A is the medial nasal process, B is the lateral nasal process, C is the maxillary process and D is the mandibular process. Now, over here we are, we have to find that which two processes are not fused and it leads to the formation of oblique facial cleft. For the oblique facial cleft, there will be non-fusion between the maxillary process that is C over here and lateral nasal process that is B. So, that is B is not fusing with the C and that is why the oblique facial cleft occurs. So, in this question number 197, the option B is the correct answer. So, option B is the correct answer for the oblique facial cleft. So, that completes the discussion for the anatomy questions over here. Thanks to all of you.